Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Two View, the cutting edge podcast for emergency nurse practitioners and physician assistants in acute care, emergency, and urgent care. I am NP Martha Roberts here with my co host, PA Mike Sharma, and a very special guest. Super hello and high fives to Dr. Diane Birnbaumer. Hi, everybody. Hey, hi, hi Mike. Hi, Martha. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is PA Mike Sharma. Welcome, Diane. You will be our oblique view for this Two View podcast today. <laughs> Somehow that's absolutely apropos. Where do I even start with the introduction for Diane? I've known Diane personally and professionally for several decades. Diane is truly an incredible physician and educator in the fields of EM. She is exuberant, witty, talented, great speaker. And on top of that, she is a very caring and kind soul and a great listener and loyal friend with a zest for life traveling, and she makes beautiful handmade pottery. By the way, she's truly my hero. As for her credentials, they are mighty. She is an emeritus professor of medicine for the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. She is also a senior clinical educator for the Department of Emergency Medicine at Harborview Medical Center, and she was the associate program director at Harborview UCLA Medical Center for the department's EM residency from 1991 to 2011 where she was directly involved in educating hundreds of resident physicians. And on top of that, she's our co-director of the EM boot camps for the Center for Medical Education. Well, wait, that's not all. Diane also teaches and lectures for multiple other courses for CCME, including the Acute Care Series and the Emergency Medicine Board of You courses. She is a well-known staple speaking at conferences around the country, including ASEP, and is highly respected by other groups such as Feminem and countless others. Diane is the recipient of ASEP's Outstanding Speaker of the Year Award and its Outstanding Contribution to Education Award. In addition, Dr. Birnbaumer has received the California Chapter of ASEP's Education Award. We're gonna put some of her publications in the liner notes so you can look at and just admire at her brainy wonderfulness. And also some sample lectures she's done for the EM boot camps. We were taking one of her talks from our CCME boot camps called A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. And we're making it very interactive and we hope a little bit fun. So we'll be discussing four cases in detail with some interesting education and conversation in between, all uh, courtesy of Diane. And now some of you that have gone to the original boot camp, you're thinking, uh, I didn't hear Diane give this talk. It's because it's at our advanced emergency medicine boot camp. That's coming up in September. So if you like this talk, you like this podcast, there is a part two that we're not even getting into yet. You're going to love the advanced emergency medicine boot camp. Um, Diane's going to talk about this talk and kind of thinking about thinking, uh, this metacognition uh, with her, with me, with Martha, our other talented faculty like Dr. Bucata, Dr. Milne, Dr. Jim Roberts, Dr. Randy Danielson, all folks we've had on the, the show already. Um, like I mentioned, Martha and I will also be there, and we're always looking for folks to, to meet and attend out there in the Two View universe. If you're listening to this before July 16th, 2021, you could just kind of drop everything, you know, leave a note for your, your pet sitter and just meet us at the original Emergency Medicine Boot Camp in Las Vegas at Planet Hollywood. That's the original boot camp in July. Or, and really consider this now, considering how scheduling goes, log into your scheduling app, box off September 13th through 15th, and join us in just a few short months at the Advanced Boot Camp at the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas, where Diane gives both parts to this lecture educational series, A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. In addition, we're going to provide the link to the talk that we provide on Facebook, actually, and we have it on our YouTube site for CCME. So we'll put that all in the liner notes for you. So let's get started. First, Diane, I'd like to ask you, why did you develop this lecture? What makes it a bit different uh, than just talking about cases? And what do you hope people will get out of this talk? Well, thanks, you guys, for the introduction. It's sort of um, alarming to hear lists of things when you <laughs> The amount of time and energy that went into all of that. And I want to make it just a tiny clarification, Martha, because it, it does happen frequently as far as the place I work, this name. Um, it's Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Some people think it sounds like Harvard. It's not, even though some, some of our wheelchairs had spray painted on the back of them, Harvard UCLA, which is wrong. Um, I work at Harbor UCLA. It's not the Harbor View in Seattle. It's not the Harvard back in Boston. It's Harbor UCLA in Southern California. Um, it's a county hospital. I've been there forever and a day. You will have to 
pry me out with my cold, dead hands grasping, <laughs> grasping the door of the emergency department because I really love it there. Um, so that, that's sort of a little bit of the background. I want to thank so much for the introduction. Um, the, this talk is one, as I've been teaching for a long, long time, I realized that as a learner and as a teacher, we kind of default into um, what am I thinking or jump to the answer or just tell me what you think. And we never really get into how you think. Now, Mike tossed around a term in his introduction there, kind of went over it pretty quickly, called metacognition. And the point of this talk is to think about how we think. One of the things I've learned over the years is that people can come to the right conclusion for the wrong reasons, and people can come to the wrong conclusion with the right ideas, but just a few gaps in there. And if they really sit down and think about how they think, and they develop a system on how to think, those gaps tend to get filled. In the emergency department or in urgent cares or in fast track kind of situations, you're kind of, there's a brand new person to you every single time. And you have the chance to get, gather some information, kind of interpret it and figure out what you think is wrong. But the key is to think about how you think about that. So when I developed this talk, what I really wanted to focus on was not the typical case presentations that you hear about, where somebody presents a case, says, what do you think is wrong? What do you want to do? I want to talk about how you get to that. What do you think is wrong? And what do you want to do? And how you weigh the things that are involved. I think what it's going to help you with when you finish this, listen to this podcast, is to have a system you use every single time to help keep you aware of the things that could hurt someone, kind of not going out into the weeds, but staying in the things that are most likely wrong and keeping your differential deep by thinking about the, the kind of interesting and unusual things that could be causing this person's problem. It's a system I've called SPIT. Uh, I've done it forever. I learned this actually 20, I don't even know, 25 years ago from a PhD in education who just brought this up as an idea of a way to organize the way people think about things in emergency medicine. The S is for serious. The P is for probable. The I is for interesting, and the T is for treatments, the things that you would do at those points in time. So we'll come back to that. You're going to hear that over and over again to the point where it's going to be actually in your sleep or while you're driving, you're going to have it as a mantra. Um, but it'll help you think as you get through the things that we go through. I thought it was a really great mnemonic, and I really want to jump right into this first case. So I'd like to introduce the complaint, and then maybe you could lead us down the roads of discovery here. So, All right, so the case number one, the headache. And this is the patient that comes in and says, I just wanted to get checked out. I had a terrible headache yesterday and now it's gone. So that's something that always strikes fear in me. Someone who starts out with, I just wanted to get checked out. Usually that means they're worried about something and you need to first of all, figure out what they're worried about. But second of all, you need to also be concerned. It should get the hackles in your neck up a little bit. So here's who this patient is. She's 22. She's in very good health, no past medical history. She developed a severe headache um, on the way to work yesterday morning. So she was driving, she developed a severe headache. It lasted about an hour. She took an acetaminophen for it, had one episode of vomiting, but otherwise was feeling okay. Um, the headache went away. It's been completely resolved since she basically, since she got to work yesterday, she feels fine, but she just stopped by because she wants to get checked out. When you examine her, her vitals are normal, her exam is normal, everything is completely normal. Now think about the shifts that you work. This is typical, right? You have somebody, you, you dash into the room, you get this information on her history, you do your exam, which hopefully is a good one, right? For her, you're gonna do a good neuro exam, et cetera. Um, and now you have to decide, right? You have to figure out what's wrong. Always before you get to the spit, make sure you have enough information to make that decision. So is there any other information that you might want to know. What do you think, Martha? What do you think, or, or Mike, what do you want to know? Yeah, I think you mentioned about sudden headache. Is it, did she say sudden headache? She did, she said sudden. I always like struggle on how to ask this question because you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you ask a bad question, you're gonna get a, an answer that does not really drive you towards a decision point. Can you just tell me how do you ask this question about sudden headache and differentiate that in a way that the patient kind of understands? Right. So my question when I ask people this is, did it did it catch you all? Did it did it basically come on maximally at onset? Is it something that it's like, wow, one second I'm fine, and the next second, all I can think about is this headache. It just like it just caught me totally by surprise. It doesn't necessarily have to be my head exploded. It and, and honestly, it can also be, it came on pretty quickly. And within a matter of minutes, I had a terrible headache. It isn't always that finger snap. And the finger snap always gets my attention. 
you know, and my favorite case I ever saw was a guy who was watching Wheel of Fortune years ago. And he's and his chief complaint was, I was watching Wheel of Fortune, Vanna turned a T and I had severe pain. Boom. I mean, I'm not I'm not walking away from that. That's about as accurate as you can get. So asking if you can time it with something that is actually they can actually peg it to. Oh, yeah, I passed, you know, the interstate um, off ramp number 12. And th I, that's when it happened. It's like, OK, well, there you go. You got a good people. You're right. People aren't good at timing things or figuring out timing of things. That's one way to sort of approach that. OK, that's fantastic. All right. Um, how about fevers? Right. So you need to ask her specifically about fevers, right? Because we that's one of the things I need to have in my in my we're gonna go through our spit in a second, but I need to have that information to be able to spit appropriately with this person. So right, fever. So she hasn't had any. No fever. Family history of any weird head stuff like say aneurysms or cancer. Really so why do you ask that? Well, I feel like certain things like aneurysms, there's kind of like a familiar predisposition to those things. So if their mom or their dad or brother or sister, you know, uh, blew an aneurysm, then she might have a higher risk for that. Which is really important, right? So that's one of the things that we don't routinely ask with headaches, right? But if somebody gives me a worst headache of my life as they offer it, not because I ask it, they offer it, or sudden rapid onset headache, that is a good follow-up question to add to your armamentarium to become not just a good practitioner, but an excellent clinician. So that's a really good question to ask as well. What other kind of things would you need to ask of her to make your sort of spit with all the sort of full information there well these days right we're thinking about the horrible like cerebral venous sinus thrombosis right and we're seeing that with certain covid vaccinations so i want to ask you hey are you have you gotten any vaccinations recently especially asking about covid considering this young uh lady that's kind of like the population i feel like we're seeing those cvsts in if i'm not mistaken and also asking about other risk factors for venous thrombosis like say birth control or or things like that right exactly so both of those so birth control for sure although that honestly the risk is a little bit lower, but certainly it is a risk factor. And yes, immunizations, and although it is extraordinarily rare to get those cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, it is really, really rare. Um, COVID can give you that as well. Right. The key here is to ask that question. Right. The key is to ask that question. So absolutely, you've covered a lot of the things that we didn't get the first go around that you really need to be able to, especially in a fast track or urgent care situation, make an accurate sort of spit. And then eventually you've got to lay your money on the line. Well, Diane, I'm, I'm kind of curious, though, like, why today? Why not yesterday? And like that to me was a question I wanted to ask. Right, which is, and, and that's well worth asking, right? And it's never wrong to say, you know, what is it today that was, was particularly concerning to you? Don't say, why did you come in today? Oh, yeah, People that's take that as confrontational. So part of this is the nuance and the art of how we practice. So, you know, what is it today that was particularly concerning for you? Um, clearly something's concerning, and I want to make sure I address that. So if you ask her that, she said, you know, I just don't get headaches. And it was just kind of weird. You know, I, I don't know. I just not a headachy person. And wow. And no trauma, no caffeine history. Any uh, why do you travel? ask about caffeine? Well, I know what I've been like after not having a, a cup of coffee. I will get a migraine. It is severe with caffeine Absolutely. withdrawal. And people don't recognize that. You know, she may be a Diet Coke drinker. And not instead of a coffee drinker and not recognize that that has a lot of caffeine in it if you drink enough of those. So That's that right. is always worth asking. And again, you're going from a really good practitioner to a superb practitioner to add these nuances to your history. It's adding a lot of information to help you be more and more accurate. Because the, again, we're thinking about how we think. And we're going to talk about how now we order things as far as what we're going to worry about. And that, because that has to translate into action. We can't just sit there and say, gee, let's talk about this a while. At some point, we have to actually do something. So those are all excellent, excellent questions. Do you think we have enough information now to spit? I think so. Yeah, I think yeah, so. So let's do this it. together. Let's spit. What's the most serious thing this could be? When I ever hear uh, about a sudden headache and someone doesn't get them usually, then I'm worried about a bleed, you know, a subarachnoid hemorrhage or something like that. There's no fever, so I think, like, it's less likely that she has meningitis going on. Mm -hmm. um, a, a dissection that's a possibility as far as a sudden thing serious things again a, a, a mass or some sort of tumor but that shouldn't come on like very suddenly so i, no. I don't think that's like the primary thing that's going on so here. what's the first thing and you're serious what's the most what's the highest on your list a bleed a subarachnoid okay and then a few of the things that you do tickle the back of your brain and again the whole point of making this list is not to then go work them all up the whole point of making this list is to put things in boxes and then decide what you do about that so let's find our probable box. What's going to be in our probable box? 
I, I mean, you know, as much as we worked up so many of these possible subarachnoids before here that don't really go anywhere. So often, sometimes these are like the first migraine or in a typical presentation of migraine. And even just the good old fashioned, you know, tension or, or caffeine headache with some of the, so many of us using caffeine nowadays. So Mike, I'm going to actually take you back to something then. Do we have enough history? Did we forget to ask anything in our history as far as whether, because everyone has a first migraine, right? And if you think she has a first migraine, is there anything in our history that will help us feel more comfortable landing on that as our ultimate diagnosis? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I feel like a unilateral headache sometimes Could points be. us towards that. Absolutely. Um, How about a family a history? Oh, yeah, of course, right? So yeah, that, that so when you go back important. now, you, you brought up the family history of aneurysms. I would add in my family history, when I get to headaches and family history, I'm going to add aneurysms and migraines. And if she says, oh, yeah, every woman in my family has migraine, both sides of the family. Well, that makes me feel much more comfortable when I finally filter all these thoughts through. Landing on that is the ultimate diagnosis. So you're right, migraine definitely, and everyone has to have a first one, right? Maybe this is her first one. She's the right age. Um, or tension headaches, which you also mentioned. Now, when we get into the interesting, again, the point of interesting here is not to go charging down, finding every zebra on the planet. The whole point here is to just make sure that you think about it because part of our job is not to get bored with the 8 million headaches you're gonna see in your career, to find those needles in a haystack, not because you test everybody for everything, but because you let things cross your brain. We're talking about how we think. So let's, you know, together, let's all just toss out some interesting things that could be causing her headache. So I love the interesting, and I've got quite a list of ones in my brain that I think I've definitely seen and was shocked to find. I mean, shingles, for one, optic shingles can cause that really just the severe pain. Um, and actually, I want to interject something, too, because people, people interpret scalp pain as a headache. Yeah. Mm. So if somebody has shingles of their scalp, they just don't see the lesions because it's under their hair. You know, they, <laughs> they may interpret that as a headache. I've had several patients where either skull pain because it was mets to the skull or scalp pain because it was a, a neuropathy like you see with shingles was interpreted as a headache. So again, that's where your exam becomes very good. Is your scalp particularly tender? Oh, that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, that actually also leads me to the acute narrow angle closure type of headache. But you've got lots of other symptoms with acute narrow angle closure. Mm -hmm. um, what about pseudotumor? Right, which has a new name now, right? We don't call it that anymore, except right. for those of us that are ancient and gray around the temples. Those of you who are young who just graduated call this idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And we think about this in heavyweight, heavy people. She's a very slender gal, this one, but I will tell you, it is not just heavy, you know, overweight people. This can be anybody. So always worth thinking about. Yeah. What about um, a Bell's palsy? Now, I've had patients that come in with a headache and the next day um, they, they have the facial paralysis. They come in twice. I mean, I've seen people that have this really bizarre ear pain or, or headache pain, but it's usually unilateral with the Bell's palsy. It is. Um, what about CO2 poisoning? So she got the headache after being in the house and went into her car. Good. That's always a good idea. What other things could you ask then to help tease that out? Well, does she have gas in her house? She does. Is it cold outside? Right. I mean, this is a winter thing. And uh, the other thing is to say, she might say, you know, what's so weird. Is everybody in the family had a headache this morning? Boom. <laughs> done. That, that's or it. the dog was vomiting. Oh, God. You know, the dog got sick from carbon monoxide poisoning. Yeah. Those are your clinical clues. And this is the fun part of our job, right? It's like, ooh, cool. Yeah. How do I put that together? And she's too young for giant cell arteritis. I really haven't heard of a case under anybody. Let's see. Gosh. I mean, the age really is 60 or above. True. Um and medication related, you know, there are PPIs or SSRIs or even opioids can cause headaches or uh, withdrawal headaches if they've missed a dose. Right. So, so I think I, we've, we pretty much have come up with a good spit. I want to I want to just harken back to one quick thing here that Mike brought up, which is a, a carotid artery dissection. Um, that is a serious thing, but that's also an interesting thing because that is rare. Um, and so that's something that you may not. So that's why I like having something that could fall into both categories. If I forget to think about it in the spit, I'm going to go to what's the weirdo things that can cause a sudden onset headache in somebody. Oh my gosh, it's that carotid artery dissection, which can sound for all the world like a like an aneurysm rupture. It can start exactly the same way. So I and my brain have those two things basically velcroed together. Subarachnoid hemorrhage and carotid artery dissection in my brain are together because they can present with sudden onset severe headaches. If my subarachnoid workup is negative, I'm going to go back 
and ask about risk factors for dissections, things like neck movements, chiropractics, that sort of thing, where they might have had a dissection. So that was a really good thing to keep in your differential. And it is definitely serious. That's where it would fall because it can cause strokes and terrible things. But I often think of it in the interesting part because it's something that's like, what, what weirdo things could be causing this? Because it's not very common at all. But boy, if it happens and you catch it, you are an all-star. So we've talked about a lot of things. It's it, we're, we're pretend we're in Vegas because that's where the boot camp course is going to be. Where are you going to put your money, Martha? You like this stuff. We're going to spin the roulette wheel. We're going to basically <laughs> drop the ball and it's more spinning black. around. And what are you going to put your money on? Oh gosh, this is going to be a subarachnoid he uh, hemorrhage, isn't it? So it is because let's just go back to the name of the talk, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, but to be honest, it's not just because that's the name of this talk. What is it about this person? that tells you this is not just her first migraine headache. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the sudden onset is is a big one for me. You know, I, I'd rather hear about someone having a gradual over six plus hours of worsening headache, uh, but the sudden onset, and also I've never had a headache like this before. I don't, I don't care how severe your headache is or if you threw it up or not, which she has, but if I hear sudden onset, never had one like this before, then I'm, I'm concerned. And right. And we got the out. headache the right way. We got that history here the right way. Right. We didn't have to pull it out of her. She came in and said, boom, it was sudden onset. It was bad. I threw up once. She gave it to you. We didn't have to like pull it out because the people I'll tell you one thing that leads people away in this in this particular case away from subarachnoid hemorrhage is the fact that she took a Tylenol. She took an acetaminophen and her headache went away. Does that make you feel better, Mike? I mean, you 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 talked about the things that worry you. Does that make you feel better? Well, it does, but it can't completely resolve my concerns. Like, I like that she's not having, well, then I got slurred speech, and all of a sudden I can't see out of my left eye. Like, so at least, you know, there's that. She's feeling better, but I still can't take subarachnoid off the table because she got better. She could have taken a Skittle, you know, honestly. It's true. Does it matter? It, well, no, and that's the point. And I think whoever's listening to this, if you're not familiar with that aspect of subarachnoid hemorrhage, she's had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. She's had a little tiny bleed. Um, and, the, and it is a not at all uncommon thing to have the little tiny bleed pain go away because it was just a little tiny thing. And Tylenol can make it get better. The typical sort of migraine meds can make it feel better. You're, a Skittle can make it, it can go that way on its own. And I think the key is that initial history is what should get under your skin. That initial history is what should kind of really get you going. And and we're hesitant to do it, right? It involves, you know, what are we to scanning and sometimes LPing and oh my gosh, it's like a big workup. But this is one that we need to talk about why this is important not to miss this. Okay, she's 22. This is an important diagnosis. And let's go into the details as to why. So kick it off, you guys. All right. So Dan, this is a great case and very scary. And I'm going to, I'm going to list multiple resources in our liner notes that not only come from really reputable sources, um, but also will help you with a stepwise approach to identifying, diagnosing, and treating subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now there are some great concept maps and flow charts and decision trees out there that can help you to your path of discovery and help you also spit up, which I kind of like that phrase too. No, we're not going there. <laughs> no, we're sticking with spit. So, so work on your own spit and use these trees and also your brain in the way that Diane has suggested here. So I want to first say that ASEP likes to ask these critical questions and then answer them based on evidence on their website. The first question they ask in regards to subarachnoid hemorrhage is, in the adult emergency department patient presenting with acute headache, does a normal non-contrast head CT performed within six hours of headache onset, preclude the need for further diagnostic workup for subarachnoid hemorrhage? And the answer is yes. The use of a normal non contrast head CT performed within six hours of symptom onset in an emergency department headache patient with a normal neurological examination to rule out non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage is acceptable. You will not need to do an LP to further exclude subarachnoid hemorrhage. But I'm going to throw that back to Diane for a minute. Because I want to see, we have this argument at boot camp all the time. Was it five hours? Was it seven hours? Should I do the CT? Should I do the LP? I mean, we talk about it at every course. We do. Although I, although this is, this case is the perfect one as far as her onset part. She can tell you exactly when this happened. She was in her car. She was on a short drive to work. She can tell you, she can peg this. And it needs to be by that by the criteria you're talking about that, that they used, the study that they used, which is a landmark study. Um, it was maximal within an hour. So it had to be something that just, it could start not so bad, but within an hour is like, holy Toledo, what is happening here? Um, that had to be that. 
the other thing to know about this is that, and most of us, this is not an issue. Um, it needs to be a, a third or fourth generation CT scanner. Most of the old ones are somewhere in a junkyard. We don't really have them anymore. I don't think anywhere in the country here, but it also should be a neuro neuroradiologist. The, the reality is most of our radiologists across the country now, for the most part, are good at reading these things. And the key is for them to commit themselves to normal CT scan. And if you have any concern where you look at it and it looks, well, I don't know, it looks a little weird around that circle of Willis, call and say, Do, are you sure that's clean in there? If they say, yep, we're sure, then you're good to go. You really have, the study is good, you're medically legally protected, you're medically protected because you're still doing the right thing for the patient. It's not just being motivated by a might get sued. Um, it, is, it is, I think, an acceptable practice here, as long as the all of the little dot, I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Well, you mentioned, yeah, medical legally, right? Because here's, here's the hard part of our job. We can do the right thing and the patient still has a bad outcome. And so then all the quarterbacking happens later on. Well, if you had just done this and the patient would still be alive today. But, you know, I like these guidelines and policies we're talking about because you cite your knowledge of this guideline in your chart. And, and then, you know, it gives you this leg to stand on to say, hey, this is the reason why I did this. And most reasonable practitioners would also do the same thing. It's unfortunate there was a bad outcome, but but I was doing the right thing. And it just happens sometimes, you know. Um, so here's further along these guidelines that we're talking about here. Um, what if we're just still not sure? You know, um, they're at risk for a subarachnoid hemorrhage. They've had a negative non-contrasted head CT. Well, what do we do then? Um, do we do a CT angiogram of the head? Or do we have to do a lumbar puncture to safely rule out the subarachnoid? Uh, the answer in the ASAP policy is perform the lumbar puncture or the angiogram to safely rule out the hemorrhage. So do one CT of these- CT angiogram, right? The CT uh, yes, angiogram. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. I apologize. CT angiogram, you're right. Um, do one of those things to further rule out somebody with a negative non-contrasted head CT. And uh, you know, one of my favorite phrases and concepts, use that shared decision-making between you and the patient to decide on what to do because you know, there is potential risk for each choice, maybe the risk of missing with the imaging study versus the risk of introducing an infection into a sterile space with a lumbar puncture. Um, because this is a PA and NP podcast, I just want to highlight this is one of the situations that if you have not yet brought in your collaborating physician on this case, it's important you do it at this point and really document their involvement in the case and that, hey, the whole team was involved and agreed with the course here. Yeah, so I want to I want to interject a little bit. I totally agree. These are high risk cases, extraordinarily high risk cases, and it is clear we work up way more than we diagnose. And there, and I, honestly, I think it's fine in this because the downside of missing it is extraordinary. Um, the the downside of a workup that's negative has a few things, but nothing that's going to alter the patient's life forever or kill them. Um, and and just to kind of harken back a little bit to your idea of shared decision making, which is fine, sort of. Um, the idea of an LP introducing infection, it's if you do your LPs right, you will not introduce infection. So that's not really a risk. The biggest risk of an LP is a post-LP headache. They already have one. Um, so that's, you know, I, I, it may get a little bit worse, but they already are there for that. That's They've already kind of done that. Um, the key here, honestly, I, shared decision-making is fine. But when the stakes are really high, um, you need to really be a strong advocate for the workup you know needs to happen. People are afraid of LPs. That's why it's fine to do a CTA instead. That's fine. You'll find the aneurysm, which is the most common cause of these things. Uh, but again, shared decision-making, when the stakes are high, you become pretty much a strong advocate of completing the workup rather than, you know, it doesn't really make any difference if we do the test or we don't. You're going to be okay. Um, it just would be a little cleaner for us to know for sure what's wrong. What are those things? So again, when you may do shared decision-making, a lot that goes into that is what are the stakes involved here? Yeah, very, very good advice. And, you know, we have put in the liner notes several papers that I think will be very useful for people to take a look at. Um, I did include one paper in regards to basically looking at the different modalities to looking at the head and the brain itself um, from CT, CTA, um, and MRI. And that's in a, a paper by the um, Dr. Marcolini in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine in March 2019 entitled The Approach to the Diagnosis and Management of Subarachnoid Hemorrhage. So I just want to kind of move along here. And 
Uh, also, just remind you that we put some information by uh, the American Heart Association in our liner notes to discuss some of their decision tree and literature uh, information for you to support the workup and treatment of finding subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, but Mike, I just wanted to say there was one study that I found very interesting um, in regards to uh, pregnant patients, actually. And this was a study in the Journal of Neurosurgery in February of 2013 that looked at patients with known aneurysms and if they ruptured during pregnancy or delivery. I mean, talk about horrific. I've had these patients come in with, with little headaches and they're pregnant. I mean, the headache in the pregnant patient could be a whole discussion in itself. Um, but what I thought was interesting here was that they were essentially trying to look at the rate of aneurys aneurysmal rupture, was it, whether it greater in the pregnant patient or not. So the, they found that the chance was about 1.4% of rupture during pregnancy. And some clinicians opt to have a C-section. And this article discusses um, whether they wanted to do an elective C-section in patients with aneurysms. However, their conclusion was that they were unable to find an increased association between pregnancy or delivery and the risk of rupture of aneurysms, cerebral aneurysms. Now, they also concluded that maybe these C-sections were being done unnecessarily. And, you know, to break HIPAA here, I always love putting in a real life story. So I actually have a small two millimeter aneurysm in my left ICA. And, you know, some neurosurgeon wanted to clip it. The other one said to watch it. The third opinion was let's watch it. And that's what I did. Um, I also had preeclampsia in my pregnancy. And so they elected to do a C-section and I do not regret it. And I remember having these discussions and Mike, you brought up shared decision-making. Um, you know, they wanted, I had a headache towards the end, of course, cause I was preeclamptic and they wanted to CT me or just do a C-section. Um, and we talked about, could this, you know, be my aneurysm rupturing? And I just said, you know what, let's just do the C-section. Let's get this over with. And they treated me and I ended up not dying. Uh, but <laughs> you know, I have family history of aneurysms. Um, so every time I get a migraine and it's been a stressful week, I've had a glass of wine and I might be at the craps table. I'm always thinking my head is going to explode. So, um, anyway, Mike, <laughs> did you want to mention anything uh, about uh, any of the American Heart Association discussions or even the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule? Hey, how about that? I got to always bring up Ottawa, my birthplace here in the world. Um, <laughs> so many that. rules named after Ottawa, and there is the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule. So let's just talk about how this works, okay? It is a decision rule that has a high sensitivity to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so basically, if they pass all the criteria then you can feel very comfortable saying, hey, we've worked this up enough. They have an, they have the absence of all the high-risk factors. Don't have to worry so much about subarachnoid hemorrhage. The hard part is that it has a low specificity to rule in, meaning if they have one of these things, then you're kind of in for a penny, in for a pound sort of thing. You have to kind of at least think about it more, document more very strongly why you wouldn't want to work up subarachnoid hemorrhage in a patient. Let's talk about the criteria briefly. Age greater than or equal to 40 years. Complaint of neck pain or stiffness. A witness loss of consciousness. Onset with exertion. The thunderclap headache, or I think you probably also include whatever other sudden headache, you know, uh, euphemism you want to use there. And also just on exam, objectively a limited neck flexion. That's the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule. And Diane, what do you think about using those types of decision algorithms and uh, plans of attack? Um, so I think you have to know what you're getting when you get these rules. Um, some of them are superb. Some of them are not so strong. Some of them have things that you can even see within the rule itself, just going through the list that Mike just read, where you know there could be problems that could come up between one practitioner and another agreeing on something. For instance, limited neck flexion on exam. Um, what is that? They define thunderclap headache in this particular paper, um, but that is something that is some, that you, I may consider it limited neck flexion, you may not. Um, the patient may say it hurts. Is that enough? So these are all of these are great. And I like having them around as concepts, but using them as a be all end all, I think you have to be careful. And what I like about MD Calc is that it doesn't just have the scoring system. It has the reasoning behind it and it has yes. the papers linked in there. So I really, they've made this a very robust app to use. So for any guideline you use, if you're using it, make sure you click into the background stuff so that you have some idea of what you're getting for what you're using. 
Um, so th these rules are fine. Um, this one I actually think is interesting and I do go to it because I, it just reminds me of certain things, but it is sort of like the perk rule for PE. They have to all be negative. Um, you don't get a little bit of wiggle room here. It's an all or none phenomenon here, just like the perk rule. And if, again, Mike's right. If one of these doesn't fit, you're, you're kind of now stuck. Um, and I'm not aware of this being shown to be better than good, good at least a physician. I don't think they've tested a lot of, uh, of other clinicians, but physician gestalt. I don't think it's been proven to be that much better than being a good clinician at the bedside. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you haven't heard us talk enough about subarachnoid hemorrhage, I highly suggest listening to Dr. Al Sacchetti and Chris Carpenter do a nine minute discussion on this topic on MRAP. So uh, please take uh, some time to look again at our liner notes where you can find the links to all this stuff. I'm going to give the final word on subarachnoids, of course, to Diane. So Diane, what do you want to recap here for us? All right, let's wrap. So the things to remember is not every headache is benign, but also not every headache is terrible. So be a good clinician in these things. And if your spidey sense when you walk away says, wait, it was sudden, it was severe, she threw up once, she may be better now, but if I miss this subarachnoid thing, this could basically kill her. And I just will tell you the natural history of subarachnoid, if you miss this, the little tiny bleed, is that within seven to 10 days, that clot breaks down, that aneurysm bleeds big, you have a 50% mortality rate and a 90% morbidity rate. Your job is to pick it up now. And honestly, I am perfectly fine personally with working up nine negatives for every positive um, because of the stakes in this thing. Um, I'm not going to do that for something where the stakes are less. You know, I don't. If you have pneumonia today with your cough and I miss it, and you're going to probably be fine if I pick it up tomorrow. This one is not the same. So again, factor in sort of the how serious is this, and if I miss it today, is it that big a deal? But don't again, don't go crazy. The key here is not to walk into out of every headache person's room with, oh my gosh, I have to work them up for cyberarachnoid. The key is to go through your spit. Be a very careful practitioner. Now know the things to go back and add to your history so that you are even more accurate um, and then just proceed accordingly. I'm going to have a headache if we talk more about headaches. So let's move on <laughs> to case two, a knee. All right. So this is more along my speed here. Okay. A knee. Okay. Uh, the chief complaint with this patient is right knee pain. And the patient, interestingly, doesn't walk in. They come in on crutches. So Diane, tell us about this patient. All right, so this guy is 28 and he's a jock. There's no question. He is coming in on his crutches as if he could dance with those crutches. He's like totally buff, really works out. He has no past medical history and he does come in using his crutches. He says, you know, my right knee is killing me. I was playing basketball yesterday. It really started to bug me while I was playing basketball. Now, I just don't want to walk on it. It hurts too much. Um, I've never hurt these joints before. I don't have any other joint problems before. I must've heard it playing basketball because that's when it started to bug me. Um, and when you, when you examine him, his vital signs are completely normal. His exam is normal, total body check. So you'll kind of look everywhere. We'll talk about what you check later. Um, his knee is mildly swollen. It's warm. Um, it's tender to palpation. And it's markedly decreased range of motion. And it's not just his, you know, say you ask him to move his knee, but you try to move his knee and he won't let you. It just hurts. And when you try to test his ligaments because you're worried about the internal things that could have happened while he was playing basketball, he, it doesn't work. You can't check drawer signs and Lachman's and it's just too painful. You can't test his ligaments due to pain. So that's what you have on your history and your exam. Is there anything more you need to know before you're ready to do your spit? You know, I, I always... I laugh when someone says, well, it must have been X, Y, Z. I see this a lot in my occupational medicine gig, you know, like, oh, you know, well, uh, I, eight hours after I left my shift, this started happening to me. And it surely was something I did during my shift, you know, and, uh, you know, I understand I, it's not a criticism of the patient or talking bad about them, but this is just the nature of uh, humanity. We want to connect and tell a story. And that's just how it makes sense in our brain. I played basketball, my knee hurts, there must be a connection there. But right, there was and no actually, Mike, I'm gonna interject a second. That's a cognitive error. We yeah, make exactly. Them, and patients make them. He's not yes. trying to mislead you. He, no. he tries to tie it together. You're exactly right. Our job is to untie that. Is to is to say, whoa! Did you actually hurt it playing basketball? My the other one of those I, I must haves that scares me is the older person who's a fall who says, I must have tripped. I found myself on the floor. That's a that's somebody who had a syncopal episode. I'm sorry, you got to go back. It's like so the, that I must haves are an, another thing. It's like ooh, time for me to be a really good clinician. That was absolutely spot on. You can start building your wolves in sheep clothing uh, part three with yeah. that one there. Okay. <laughs>
Well, some rapid fire ones. I want to hear about signs of current or recent infection, general urinary, gastrointestinal. Do you have a sore throat? Any problems uh, back there in the rectum? Maybe eye stuff. Do you have a red eye? Any rashes you can't explain? Uh, do you do you happen to use recreational drugs, especially IV drugs? And and then always the 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 Hail Mary one. Any recent travel? Yeah, absolutely. And and on the physical exam, I mean, I'm looking for any skin lesions to the knee, any scratches, cuts, is there redness, is there swelling? Um, you know, is it just one side of the joint? Is it the entire joint? And I'd want to check to see if the base, the patient basically, you know, was neurovascularly intact. Is the distal extremity worth, you know, documenting, you know, is their calf also swollen? You know, all these different things I'd want to look at as well. Absolutely. So, and the question, and I think for the listeners here, I want you to, while you're listening to this, why they're asking these questions, think about what's the background. Why, why does Mike care about the guy having GI symptoms or GU symptoms or diarrhea? Or why does Martha care if the joint has, is tender everywhere or just on one side? And, and this is the kind of thing where you think your history is complete, but actually there's a lot of gaps in there. You know, did he have a foreign body? What does he do for a living? Does he lay carpet for a living? You know, find out there's a lot of things that can help you figure out why this young man is suddenly on a set of crutches sitting in front of you and you've got to make a decision what's what. And with all of these things in there, again, you guys in the, that are listening to this, you factor in sort of the things you would want to know. But I think it's a good time to spit here because we've got this guy sitting there. We've got to make a decision what to do. So what do you think the most serious thing is here? Well, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I'm thinking septic arthritis. It's Why are you hot. thinking that? Well, I mean, is it hot or swollen, did we say? It is. It's hot and swollen. Okay. Well, there you go. And there's no real history of bad enough injury, you know, to take him off his feet. So is there pain on passive ranging? I want to know yes, that. Yes, there is. Absolutely. Hmm. Well, then I'm also so why thinking... does that make a difference? Why does pain on pass? So hot and swollen, I'm just going to take you back to this. So let's say he did rupture his ACL. So you rupture your ACL, you definitely get swollen and you can get warm because there's blood in there. So it can be warm. So that, that still doesn't help me a lot differentiate the two, but you mentioned passive range of motion pain. What does that tell me? You know, it, if something is in there irritating the joint, whether it's uh, immune complexes, uh, bacteria, or crystals, you know, that irritation is going to cause him to really guard against the passive ranging. So I worry about something in the joint, want to hear about, no, I don't even want you to move it for me. Mm -hmm. Or stand on it, right? uh, yeah, which exactly. is another thing. It's like, even, if you injure your knee, you usually can still stand on it. It's just as uncomfortable, but it's not this bad. So you're right. Something's in there causing trouble. So the most serious thing that could be in there causing trouble, Martha mentioned, it's like infection. We're worried about that. That's the most serious. It's just because that can destroy the joint. But let's talk about the most probable thing here. Mike, what do you think it probably is? <laughs> I think it's also probably a septic arthritis, some sort of an infectious etiology here. There's too many nasty things on this person's exam and not enough of a history to make me think this is a vanilla musculoskeletal knee sprain or something. Right. And the fact he doesn't have a fever shouldn't dissuade you from this being a septic joint. Most people oh. with septic joints do not have fevers. So yes, it's an infection, but it doesn't cause a fever usually. So that's something that shouldn't dissuade you. Now, and the interesting things though, because we're we're going to go ahead. This guy is not going to leave. We're going to go ahead and do some things for him. Um, but let's add our interesting, because remember, we're keeping our differential deep. So what are the interesting things that could be in there? Uh, you know, uh, gout and pseudo gout. I mentioned the crystal deposition here. Um, reactive or writer's arthritis. You know, we all learned the whole can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. So that's why I was asking about the red eye, potentially. Um, we all think about this with, you know, can't pee, a genital urinary infection, but also some sort of enteric infections can cause this. So like, did you go camping recently? Are you having, you know, something like that going on? And also these can be acquired not just by camping, but also uh, camping with others, sexually transmitted uh, ways of getting enteric infections. Camping with okay. others. I like Ooh, that. Good times. Good euphemism, right? Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys camp together, if you know what I mean? So yeah, well, we can ask about that later on. Um, uh, you know, uh, all these weird different other infections, Lyme, Zika, uh, chicken, gunya, like there's all these different crazy ones here. Um, but usually I feel like there's fever at some point with those. Um, and travel, and, right? We needed to ask about travel for those. Yeah, mm -hmm. you think there'd be travel or uh, some sort of endemic area um, movement there. Um, well, Mike, you, put, you made a note that you're, I see here, cancer. You know, it could always be cancer. So... It, 
It always could be cancer. You know, we <laughs> never be. know. It's not going to be as sudden as this guy um, says potentially, but could he have a pathologic fracture that was kind of like brewing and all of a sudden it popped? Like, it could And in his age cancer. range, that can happen. Testicular right. cancer can happen in his age range. No question you about guys, it. He's a little old for osteosarcoma, but that's still possible too. You so guys that's are also smart. Weird. I love this. <laughs> so now that we've sort of chatted about all these interesting, probable, serious things, what do you think this is and what are you going to do? So when do you pipe in? What do you think this is? I have to give him some sort of pain medication, and that's going to be some degree of a test here. Um, you know, let's give him something strong, something kind of like opioid level here. I want to get an X-ray, you know, because, again, if we see some sort of pathologic fracture in here, wouldn't that be a nice thing to catch early on? Someone who can't walk has earned an X-ray, in my opinion, here. And then uh, let's let's get some labs, you know, and this patient will get some labs. Um, so CBC, CMP. We're kind of thinking down the septic arthritis pathway. And so I think we're going to want to get an ESR and a CRP if that's kind of how your ortho rolls. Uh, blood cultures, if we're thinking the whole reactive arthritis thing, maybe we get like an HLA B27 and that can kind of help us out down the road. So lots, we're getting a, kind of more than I would get for most patients with this this patient. Do you Would you really order all of those things right now, Mike? Because what? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna have you put your money where your mouth is. What do you think? Get, put the first thing on your differential. What do you think is wrong with this guy? I, I honestly would order all these things right now because this guy can't walk. Like I, I don't want to burn an hour giving him some pain medications and getting X-ray, which I don't think will show anything. Frankly, mm -hmm. we're just kind of like doing it to check off the the obvious bad stuff here. Sure. I don't want to burn an hour giving him pain medications and letting him. Oh, oh, you're still not. You still can't walk. Okay, well then right. we'll do so all these So I'll tell things. you I'll tell you my approach to a patient like this. Um, when I walk out of the room, and, and I understand, I think all of those tests could be indicated, definitely could be indicated. But when I walk out of a room of a patient like this, the odds are in a 28-year-old guy who can't wait bear, who is sexually active when you go back and ask him, having a single hot joint that is his knee, the odds are extraordinarily high this is gonorrhea. Um, that is a septic joint from gonorrhea. And my job then, I, what I would do, my approach is go where the money is mm -hmm. and tap that joint. Stick a needle um, in it. And and see what's in there. Um, and again, because what that might do for me and what it, what it could save me perhaps is some of those other tests that may be indicated to help me differentiate, but I might be able to just differentiate on purpose up front mm -hmm. by deciding really what I think it is and going for the money and then if that doesn't pan out, um, the odds are extraordinarily high it will. If that doesn't pan out, then the, some of those other tests might be indicated. A SED rate still isn't going to help me with gonococcal arthritis, a CRP. They may be up, um, but that's going to mean that I still then later have to tap his knee. So I think, and if it's gout or pseudo gout, you need to tap his knee. There's a lot of reasons you need to get joint joint fluid out of that guy. Thank goodness it's a knee. Super easy, super fun. Um, knees are super easy to tap. So this is somebody where there are a lot of a lot of things you could order, absolutely, and there's a lot of things in his differential. But I think the point of the way we think about this sort of spit thing is to try to narrow it down a little bit, um, to try to focus on what we really think is wrong today, go for what where the money is there, and then if that doesn't pan out, we can the, the HLA twenty seven is going to be later. We're not going to get that today. Right. Um, the CRP and SED rate certainly we can get today, but if those are high, I still have to do something else, right? I'm missing something. So part of this again is I like the thinking again. We're metacognition, whatever metacognating. Let's make up a word. We're metacognitioning like yeah. um, to sort of think this through. So so my thought process, I think of the same differential you do, but my approach would be a little bit different. And that I think this is again why we're all different practitioners and why we talk about things like this. That's great. Okay. Well, um, yeah, definitely cultures, not just of the joint fluid, but we're going to all the orifices, you know, like let's check urine uh, and mouth and even rectum. And, and you know, at, at the point where we, uh, you know, swab the rectum, he's probably like, boy, I was just trying to scam out of work. I, I really should have picked a different <laughs> chief complaint. <laughs> you know, okay, let's, let's swab the rectum, I guess. Anything for the work note. And why? So the reason you're swabbing the rectum for people who are wondering why in God's earth would you swab a rectum in somebody who has a hot knee is that gonorrhea disseminates to get to that knee. And so it has to come from somewhere. So when you're worried about gonorrhea and this guy, I'm definitely worried about gonorrhea. I have to not just culture and tap, you know, the joint where it went. I have to also figure out how it got there. So the blood absolutely is indicated and you're going to send it and you're going to mention gonorrhea specifically. And you need to figure out where it came from. 
So in a man, it's usually the urethra, but it could be his throat, depending on what his sexual practices are. It could be his rectum, depending on what his sexual practices are. So you're going to have to culture where it came from, how it got there, and where it went. So that's why all those tests are done. If you're a faithful listener, you'll recall back to episode, I think it was one, where we went over the changes in the CDC guidelines of how to treat gonorrhea and chlamydia nowadays. And uh, we didn't talk about it on the podcast, but there are other ways to treat if you're worried about um, disseminated infections or other kind of atypical infections. So throw it back to the CDC guidelines on those that came out last year. Really be aware of what the up-to-date uh, info is. I see uh, some folks still talking about azithromycin for chlamydia, which you have to treat in this patient when you have a suspected gonorrheal infection and you haven't ruled out chlamydia yet. You want to also give that co-treatment for chlamydia as well. So go back to our first episode and also look at the CDC guidelines. We will include those guidelines in our liner notes at uh, twoview.fireside.fm. That is the number twoview.fireside.fm. Quick pearls here as far as uh, most likely most dangerous things to happen here. Gonorrhea is the most common cause of septic arthritis in sexually active adults, which he endorses here. Um, Staph aureus, in general, is still the most common cause of septic arthritis overall in all people. And um, the way that gets there, again, like Diane said, it's got to come from somewhere unless you see like a cut on the person's knee. Well, that kind of makes it a little bit easier. But if it's not going to come directly from a lesion to the knee, it's often coming from things like IV drug use or other kinds of ways that dirty things are put under and into the skin and the vasculature. So that's why we're kind of asking about those issues. And we could get real deep on how you ask about those things in the best way. It is not just a matter of asking, hey, uh, does it burn when you pee right now? Or are you having any nausea or vomiting? These disseminated infections are often asymptomatic in terms of the GI or GU symptoms. That's where they come from, but they often are not having active infection in those body systems when you get this septic arthritis. So Diane, um, let's go ahead and, and hit the uh, high points for not missing a gonococcal arthritis in these patients. Perfect. So um, monoarticular arthritis in sexually active young people, especially if it is a knee, is gonorrhea till proven otherwise? And just imprint that in your head, make that a synapse, because if you miss it, gonorrhea will destroy that joint in short order. So, and think about it, young, healthy person, destroy, destroyed knee, never a good thing. So monoarticular, septic, again, irritable when you move it, don't like to bear weight, warm to touch, that is a septic joint, consider that gonorrhea till proven otherwise. The testing involves culturing where it came from, how it got there and where it went, you want to treat it right away. So don't ignore this. That you've got it. gonorrhea is nasty, nasty, nasty in there. The white cells destroy things. So treat it. It's ceftriaxone on higher doses than you're used to. And just go and look it up on the CDC website. Don't memorize this stuff. Just look it up. The other thing to know about this before we wrap this particular case is do not fly on your own on this one. Get your supervising whoever to know about this case because it is a high risk case. And the ultimate treatment here is not antibiotics only. The ultimate treatment involves washing out the joint, so an orthopedic surgeon must be involved. Virtually every septic joint, gonococcal or otherwise, an orthopedic surgeon must be involved. So there's your summary of a hot joint and a young guy who comes in on crutches. So, you know, if you're having uh, trouble, you know, trying to figure out when is a good time to talk to your supervising physician, what I like to do is if I say, hey, you know, I want to run a few patients by you, doc, and they say, yeah, 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 I'm a little bit busy, but we can get to it. And I'm like, yeah, I got an eye pain. I got a knee pain. And then, you know, a couple minutes later, he sees me walking by with an arthrocentesis kit. He'd be like, whoa, 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 who's that for? The eye patient or the knee patient, right? So it's like, for the knee patient. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, when, when I get present presentations from, from our nurse practitioners, I love it when they come to me and say, I think I have a case of gonococcal arthritis because. Yeah. Um, and if you can if you can sell it to me in two sentences, I'm good to go. It's like, wow, that sounds absolutely spot on. Good for you. That's great. You yeah. know, let's go tap it. All right. So let's move on to case number three. The case sore number throat. three. Go, Martha. Okay. Let's talk right. about the sore throat. So this is the patient that arrives to your department and says to you, I have a sore throat. <laughs> and I'm sure you've never heard that before, right? You're bored to tears and fast track. You're like ready to pull your hair out with the families of six that come in with everybody with a sore throat. And here you go. She is 36. 
She has a history of lupus, and I'm already going, oh, wah, 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 lupus, lupus, <laughs> uh-oh. So you already know scary stuff, right? She could have all kinds of things going on. So she has lupus. She comes in with a sore throat. She's had it for two days. Now she has three little kids. They are adorable. They are running around the emergency department. They're so incredibly cute, and they are little vectors of disease because they've all had URIs. They've had the same thing she has. She developed developed a fever this morning. She said, "Yeah, I don't know how hot, but it's I feel really warm." Um, she basically she, so a fever this morning. She's had difficulty swallowing. It really hurts when I swallow, and her voice is hoarse. And actually, when you listen to her talk, her voice is kind of like this. Hmm. She's kind of talking to you like this. Yeah, yeah. I'm really I'm just feeling a little hoarse, and my throat. It's really sore when I swallow, which is bad, and I have a fever. Here, her vital signs are normal. So when you see her, her vital signs are normal. She gives a history of a fever at home. She's not febrile when you see her. When you talk to her, she has that voice. It's like, okay, that's not normal. She has a hoarse voice. She definitely has. Her sinuses aren't tender. She has a normal OP. You look in there, it's just beautiful. You see her uvula. It's just gorgeous. It's nice and pink and normal. It's gorgeous back there. You palpate her for cervical nodes. There's no cervical adenopathy. And you check her lungs and her skin and all the other jazz. And everything else is normal. So everything is fine. Everything looks normal. Okay. Let's well, talk about whether we have enough information to make sounds any normal, kind of Diane. Decision. Sounds it normal does, to me. right? Like, check the box, send her home. Dexamethasone PO, discharge. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> so do we have enough information? Like, do we have enough information to know she's good to go? I mean, we'll probably spend five minutes asking her about her lupus history alone, just trying yeah. to understand, like, you know, okay, so you say you have lupus. Like, are you seeing a rheumatologist? Are you on drugs currently? Um, you know, what are those drugs? Then you have to go look up those drugs because they're probably some weird like MABs or whatever you know, I've never heard of before. So yeah, like that could take some time right there, understanding her lupus. But I think it's important because if she's immunosuppressed, she's going to have the weird stuff. And, and you have to be worried about that. Without question. And she didn't offer that up, which was interesting. So when you go back and ask her, you know, what's your lupus been? She said a little bit of joint pain. And you ask her, what are you taking for it? She says nothing. Hmm. Well, okay. That's okay, I guess. Uh, I'm still yeah. not. I'm still not super uh, reassured, though. Um, I'm gonna ask about immunizations too. I'm assuming, but you never know. I shouldn't assume if she's fully immunized. All right. So she says, you know, I don't know. My mom gave me all my shots when I was a kid, so I don't know. I think I'm okay. Um, got all my shots as a kid, but I don't have an, I've had my tetanus shot. That's yeah. all I'm really aware of. Such so. a dry hole for most adults to be like, "What's your immunization status?" They're like. Uh, no say. I don't know. You know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And they don't know. I mean, I don't. Yeah, well, I, mean, I don't know either. I, I, only because I have to submit it every time I apply for a job. That's why I know I can look it up. But yeah, I couldn't tell you the exact year I got my tetanus booster, for example. You know. So is that all it? Right. Is that all we need to know? All right. Are you ready to spit? I Let's think so. Spit it out. All right. So what's the most serious thing? I think the most serious thing here is epiglottitis. But right. I'm. Well. I am concerned about that and a retropharyngeal abscess. Okay. That's and the one I think about. Yeah. So there's, I mean, I did kind of think about peritonsillar abscess, but you said you didn't really see anything there. It looks so great back there. The reason why I said epiglottitis and retropharyngeal abscess is because of this really hoarse voice that she has and this mm. pain. And it's, it's not up in here. And I know you guys can't see the video, but it's not higher up. It's, it's like almost in the middle of her neck. Like she can't quite get to it. It's, 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 that pain, it, 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 it's really hurtful. It's really hurting her. So, it is. and the exam was not that impressive. So I'm like, well, hmm, what am right, I missing? So, epiglottitis, retropharyngeal abscess, really good things to think about. Febrile, sore throat, hoarse, um, definitely. So, but let's be, let's go, let's get out of the weeds for a second. Let's get into the probable stuff. What's the probable here? For real, Mike, what do you probably, think? yeah, I mean, most probably it's a viral infection. Uh, could it be? Um, more gonorrhea, like we just talked about gonorrhea in the knee, it could be gonorrhea in the oropharynx as well. It might just be an early case of strep with all of her kids running around. She caught something from her kids. Um, tonsillitis, uvulitis, I mean, her tonsils and her uvula don't look bad, but they're things I think about, um, but I don't think that's what's going on in her. No. So, so I, if I'm, if I'm again, we're going to play in Vegas. If I'm in Vegas and she's got three little kids, little snot filled, adorable things running around the department, odds are that whatever they have, she has. So you're absolutely right there. What's the interesting stuff? Well, she could have a big old tumor down there. Could. She could have a fishbone stuck. Who she knew? could have, you know, a little foreign body in there and she, or she could have a, a zinker's diverticula. I mean, it could be something totally bizarre. Um, Absolutely. All right. So we've talked about the stuff. 
serious, probable, interesting. Now we have to decide, we have to decide to do something or not, right? We have to, we have to either send her home, send some tests or do something even more. What are we going to do? All right. Well, again, those red flags, her oral pharynx exam is relatively normal. You said, but she's really hurt horse and it hurts to swallow. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to go with the epiglottitis or potentially the retropharyngeal abscess. Okay. Um, is there anything you can do on exam to help you? Like to help you kind of see, see that you really think that's what's going on. Can you so go back I, to her exam? I recall you giving us one really awesome trick. And if our listeners take away one awesome trick today, <laughs> it's the jiggle that you tell us to do. So what are we So jiggling? I've added this to my, my H-E-N-T exam. So I do my H-E-N-T exam. I'm feeling for adenopathy. And while I'm feeling for adenopathy, I put my fingers on the thyroid cartilage and I jiggle it around. Inside that thyroid cartilage live your vocal cords and what's attached to that thyroid cartilage is your epiglottis. And if you jiggle that thing around and they're like, oh, that's it. That's what really hurts me. You're done. <laughs> you, yes. you now know you are not sending her anywhere and you have to do more. Okay, so we need to get into what do we do more now if we're worried about ep epiglottitis? And actually what you've done is you've d differentiated this down to epiglottitis and retropharyngeal abscess. Can you clinically tell the difference before you go doing any more tests? No. Not there, there's only one thing that might help you. I, mean, well, I, I, mean, I don't have visual, like, um, you know, the little, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the name of it. You, you see my finger moving around here. So I'm sort of like <laughs> a, a fiber optic. I don't have like a fiber optic scope in my ED. I've had others. Endoscopy. So yeah, so, gotta... I mean, there's ways you can look directly at the- You the, can. Uh, the other thing too, is if you walk in the room and she's lying down on the gurney because that's more comfortable for her versus you walk in the room and she's sitting up leaning forward on the gurney mm. because that's more comfortable for her. That's going to help you differentiate epiglottitis, which is sitting up leaning forward versus retropharyngeal abscess, which is laying down because that retropharyngeal abscess, gravity pulls the swelling away. And it's one of those little nuances to your practice that over time you're like, oh, I am worried about X or Y because this is what I saw. She, she did it, her position of comfort. She did it for you. So, so you guys both did this fiber optic thing. You both stuck your fingers up your noses actually, or in your mouths while we were doing this on the, on the video here. If anyone on this call has a GlideScope or a McGrath or any videoscope in your emergency department, you can see the epiglottis yep. on your own. You don't have to have some fancy fancy fiber optics. So let's get to talking about, about epiglottitis and what we have to do about this. All right, so adult epiglottitis has an incidence of between one and four per 100,000 per year. And in some studies has found to have a mortality rate of 7%, but up to 20%. That's a one in five chance of dying from this illness. Gosh, that's pretty dramatic. Just like we talked about in subarachnoid hemorrhage, you don't want to miss this one. We're talking about how to practice medicine in the real world and not when we're taking our boards, okay? So yes, on your boards, the patient's gonna be tripoding with drooling and strider, and you're gonna hit epiglottitis and move on to the next question here. But all these things are quite infrequent in the real world as far as presenting signs. Um, there's great literature out there talking about how these things as predictors of airway loss are, are poor predictors. Um, we can direct you to an old paper by Wolf et al. in Laryngoscope, the journal. And um, they're talking about how uh, patients who had Strider, many of them, who were treated conservatively and got better. Uh, on the other hand, there's a paper by Mayo Smith at twoview.fireside.fm, and they're describing patients who had no Strider and, and suddenly developed airway obstruction and died. And so you have to think beyond just uh, not tripoding, not having Strider, not spitting into Temesis bag, they're okay. There's there's more to it than that. And that's what I think is important while we do this talk to highlight these kind of gaps in our thinking of what we think this is going to show up as and how it may not show up like that. Yeah, you know, the literature for this was very interesting and I scoured it and I've done that before um, for previous courses and I always find something new. Um, you know, so how do we really know how to diagnose this? I, these patients can appear so differently and unreliably and it's super frustrating. So on the outside, like Diane described this, they might look okay, but what about imaging? Well, the clinical diagnosis can be supported by, as we already said, um, just looking back there with either uh, your video scope or if you want to get fancy with the nasal endoscopy. But typically, there is diffuse swelling um, 
around the structures of the epiglottis, which is when Diane said you go and you grab it and jiggle it around, they're gonna have that pain. Um, when you go to look at the imaging on an X-ray, for example, you might see something, you might've heard this again, another great board question, the thumbprint sign. Um, and we'll add what this looks like in the liner notes. We have samples of uh, radiographs to show you, but essentially the epiglottis it gets so swollen that it looks kind of like a thumb is sticking out on that lateral soft tissue radiograph of the neck. And that would suggest a diagnosis of, a, of an acute infectious epiglottitis. So there's lots of other ways to look at the epiglottis. You certainly can get a CT. Um, you certainly can take a look with the ultrasound. But one thing I actually wanted to point in your direction if you want to get fancy um, and just see some cool videos because I am a procedural person and I just thought this was really awesome. I think Diane thought it was disgusting. But there is a cool video of this Dr. Eric Levi. He's doing a nasal endoscopy on himself. And then you can see that on MCRIT. He's literally showing you how easy it is just to take a quick look. And we'll leave that in the liner notes for you to look at as well. When we're treating epiglottitis, we have to get early with the IV antibiotics. There are certain conditions where things are swelling in the oropharynx where we want to do like steroids or you know nebulized epinephrine, but these do not have a confirmed benefit in, in protecting someone's airway in epiglottitis. Again, review our liner notes for those things. Um, so we want to get ahead of this patient. Um, what can we do if we think, oh boy, this airway is about to go down south? Um, you know, standard orotracheal intubation, might have to, have to do a tracheostomy, and, um, you know, even a, a hercothyroid puncture if we're having a hard time with our traditional intubation methods. Uh, sometimes in other situations where we want to get ventilation going, you know, you can bag valve mask somebody, okay? And so, like, you know, in, in other resuscitations here. But when we're talking about you know, inflammation of epiglottitis, that can actually screw things up. So uh, we want to get some other definitive airway control and not just a bag, bag, bag for these patients. Uh, of course, we're doing some labs on these patients because they've got a legit infection, a bacterial infection. Be careful with culturing the pharynx. Uh, you know, we kind of learned that when we're talking about kids with epiglottitis. Their, their throats can seize that pretty quickly. So be, uh, be careful of kind of traumatizing back there with your swabs. Um, get that IV access early. Um, we're talking about, as far as antibiotics go specifically, uh, cefotaxim, two grams IV, or ceftriaxone, two grams IV. Um, if there's cephalosporin concerns with allergies, uh, ampicillin, uh, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, slash Bactrim are also possibilities. Um, this might be a case in which you get ID involved, or maybe ENT involved, whoever you think would be, whoever you could access and be like, hey, this is my plan, or at least this is what I gave empirically. Are you cool with that? Keep an eye on that with this patient as they continue on their hospital course and let them kind of tweak it. All right. So just summarizing epiglottitis here, Diane, what, what other pearls do you want to close with for us? So we've made the diagnosis. Um, we've started the workup and and the treatment. So can you put it all together for us? Yeah, I want to wrap this up because I want to go back to where we were, which is at the bedside. So I want to take us back to that bedside because part of this is to understand that epiglottitis is not what they're teaching now in EMT school still, which is children who lean forward and drool and are stridorous. It is no longer a disease. I have not diagnosed a case, nor have we diagnosed a case in my institution in a child in 20 years years. I've never, this is yeah. a disease of adults. The median age is 40. Vaccines change this. This is haemophilus influenza. So this is not something you, you may have been taught it in all your classes. It's in all of our books. Take children out of the loop unless they're not immunized. This is adults. And the reason that we die, we miss this in adults is they initially present like this woman did a sore throat that she's had a fever. They usually do. They may not, but she usually do. Her oropharynx looks normal. It shouldn't look normal when they have a sore throat if it's pharyngitis. It should be pharyngitis. And she is hoarse. And her and when you move her thyroid cartilage, it's tender. That is all kinds of warning signs to you that this is epiglottitis. And she may look like a rose because the airway in an adult is bigger than your thumb. The airway in a child is a drinking straw. So they got sick fast. They went down the tubes fast. It scared the hell out of all of us back in the day. These days, she can go on for 24, maybe even 48 hours of swelling until suddenly she gets strider and occludes. That's why it's crucial for you to think about the diagnosis. Go ahead and get antibiotics on board if you're worried about it. There's really no harm in that. Um, X-rays are fine, but they are not diagnostic. 
what is diagnostic is to take a look. You can either do it yourself. You, I will tell you every single time we get a, a consultant involved in these cases. So get a head and neck surgeon, someone who's going to take a look at that thing. These people are admissions, usually ICU admissions. Mm. So this is a big deal diagnosis. This is something you can't miss. Um, because the downside is terrible. And some people do fine, but boy, when they don't, they really don't. So, and this is, again, the whole point of this is to make you better at your job of things that you see a million times that you're going to find that needle in a haystack that's going to save somebody's life. I started jiggling a patient's throat last night when a patient I saw was like, let's just make sure, you know, and like the jiggle was negative. So that's good. So yeah, I've already changed my practice uh, in the process of getting ready for this talk. So I, I love it. I love the pearl. Well, let's change gears again and now to a chest pain patient. Uh, a chief complaint is chest pain earlier today. It's gone now. And I just want to get checked out. Diane, oh, tell us about yeah. this patient. There's, the, there's <laughs> that phrase that should get your hackles up again. So this guy is 50. Um, he's in pretty good health except for hypertension. Uh, and he just wants to get checked out because you know, this morning after I took my, my I take a you know, run every day, I was sitting on the couch. And while I was sitting there after my run, it'd been a little while, I developed some pressure, pressure like chest pain. Okay. It's yeah, it was like pressure on my chest and, and you know, it, I'd never had it before. Never, ever. I felt a little bit nauseated and sweaty, but I kind of sometimes do after I run. So that didn't catch my attention. Um, it lasted 15 minutes or so, but it's gone. It's totally gone now. Didn't take anything. Totally gone now. Um, otherwise nothing, no other symptoms, feeling fine. Look, you know, just doing great. His vital signs are completely normal. His exam is completely normal. And now there's your patient. What do you do with that in fast track? Don't you hate when those end up in fast track? It's like, who are you? Who did the triage? What is this doing in fast track? Yeah, especially if they're, uh, you know, I wouldn't say older. I don't think he's older, but he's not younger, you know, for sure. Well, there's lots of reasons for chest pain. A lot of them are benign, but I, it's my job in the ER to rule out the bad ones. So I'm going to ask all the standard chest pain questions. We already know, what were you doing when it happened? How long did it last for? Was there accompanying heavy sweating, nausea, vomiting, radiation, shortness of breath? You kind of answered those already, um, but we haven't gotten into yet our, our acute coronary syndrome risk factors. So smoking, diabetes, cholesterol, hypertension, parents or siblings, do they have any history of uh, coronary artery disease, especially if early? And I like to ask about drug use as well, recreational drug use. Um, and then lastly, uh, current recent infections. Um, I like heard some interesting stuff about how, you know, flu and other inflammatory things that can predispose someone to inflammation can trigger, you know, a, a heart attack or ACS downstream from a recent infection. So I'm going to ask about that as well as maybe about down the pericarditis track. Like maybe that's why he's got some chest pain. I'm going to look down at his legs, give him a little squeeze, see if they're more painful or swollen than usual. That's kind of what I'm thinking quickly about this chest pain patient who is kind of feeling good now. Absolutely. And the, and the, those are all good questions. And I said, the one that you've added that I think is really important that sometimes gets overlooked is drug use. Um, ask him if he has drug use. And the risk factors we will we would probably have gotten back to anyway, because a lot of us would get to a point of maybe even putting getting a heart score out of this guy. And you need to know all the risk factors, but absolutely need to know all that stuff. So any other any other things you would want to know, Martha, with this guy before we spit? No, I'm. You gave me the easy easy stuff here. I know what this is already. You get where's my EKG? Okay. Well, what do you think it is? I think it's acute coronary syndrome. Okay. What's so that's the most serious thing, right? What's yeah. the most probable thing? Oh, you know, it could just be anxiety. It could be GERD. You know, maybe there are these weird cases of. Adult I'm putting you onset. back in Vegas, though, Martha. What do you really <laughs> think it's GERD? What do you think it is? No, it's never GERD. So this is one of those I, guys where the serious and the probable are the same, right? The most serious yeah. thing this could be is ACS and the most probable thing this is ACS. And you're mm -hmm. saying, okay, I have 10 minutes to get his EKG before I get dinged by all the, well, the powers that be. Get but, me my EKG. Diane, I am a little concerned about aortic aneurysm as well in PE and, you know, dissection, um, a, a spontaneous pneumothorax. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking about some weird stuff too, but I just want that EKG. That's what I want. Absolutely. And you have to, right? And odds are... You're going to get that thing handed to you before you even walk in the room with these patients, the way we do right. our EKGs now. So let's talk about the EKG that gets handed to you. So the EKG, basically, they hand you this EKG and you're, instantly your eyebrows go up. It's like, oh, I'm going to describe it to all you who are listening. It's like, okay, whoa, there's something not quite right here. So it's normal sinus rhythm. So he's not brady, he's not tacky. He has a P before every QRS, QRS after every P. His intervals are fine. PR is fine. You know, TP is fine. QT is fine. All of it's fine. 
Um, those all look great. But when you look at the T waves in particular, what your eyes are drawn to in this EKG is that in V1, 2, 3, 4, V1 through 4, you notice that the T wave is not normal even a little bit into V5. In V4, it is flat, it's just inverted. It's absolutely inverted. But as you go back up for three, two, and one, V3, two, and one, you notice that it's biphasic, that that T wave is just, it goes up first and then it goes down. The ST segment is fine, but that is just, it's just, wow, that is not so normal. So mm. now- yeah, so so I'm actually, you know, one of the things we understand that a lot of people listen to this podcast, um, you know, in the car and everything, and they're not, don't, please don't look at your phone to look at this now, but I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to put a picture of the EKG up on the screen now, just so that you can take a look at that and actually see that. So, um, for those of you that are watching on the video, go ahead and, and take a look here and hopefully Diane, you want to just describe it one more time for us. One yeah, more time. So you're going to do your usual EKG re your review, do your sort of system that you each have and each of you hopefully have a system you use, but let's focus on V1, V2, V3, and V4. Look at the T waves there. If you look at V4, it's inverted. At V1, it looks, oh, maybe I could call that normal, but boy, it is absolutely not normal in V2, V3. In V2, V3, you have a distinct upward sort of uh, what looks like a normal kind of upward slope, but then it does this biphasic thing that is absolutely not normal. And the reality is you don't have to know exactly what this is right now, but you have to know that that is not something you can just say, oh, well, it's a normal variant because it is 100% not. So... That's what you're looking at. What do you guys want to do with that EKG? Well, I'm reading the machine interpretation. It just says uh, nonspecific ST segment and T wave changes. So I, yeah, I guess he can just go home, right? I mean, nonspecific, that's, that's not a big deal, right? No, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, yeah. So um, this is not good. You know, just like uh, we, we talked about the spiked helmet sign on the last podcast, this is another, you got to see it and recognize it and, and recognize that this predicts a devastating future for this patient, and you have to start acting right now to prevent it. Um, you know, this EKG pattern combined with the prior chest pain resolved by the time he showed up is known as Wellens syndrome. And if you're a grammarian like me, it's Wellens no apostrophe. It's named after a guy named Wellens, okay? So no, don't, don't throw an apostrophe in your note for these guys when you're charting it up. Yeah, that'll make the cardiologist think you're a real dummy. You don't want to do that. <laughs> Can't look bad in front of the cardiologist. Can't do that. So again, if you're if you're purely a listener to the podcast, we we really hope that you can just take a minute. You know, when you get to your shift or when you get home, take a look at what this looks like. It's it's so worth you being able to see this. Once you see it, you'll never forget it. And um, Diane, anything else that you want to tell us for some clinical pearls for this particular issue? Yeah. So this one in particular, they will be chest pain free when you see them. Um, the classic presentation of this is that they are chest pain free when you see them. In fact, this guy had a big old fat book to read because he knew he'd be sitting around the ER forever, which it turns out he wasn't sitting around the ER forever because the clinician taking care of him was very astute and realized that that EKG signifies a Widowmaker lesion in the proximal LAD. That guy is a, a heart attack waiting to happen. That's considered a pre-MI EKG. And that person doesn't go to the stress test because a stress test can precipitate the MI. That guy goes to the cath lab. Even though he looks like it was his troponin will be negative, he hasn't infarcted yet. Your job is to know that EKG is a potentially lethal EKG. The cardiologists all know that. They will say, thank you very much and whisk him away to the cath lab. Um, this, that's your key is your job is to pick that up. So one other thing I kind of like to add, having a father who was a toxicologist, is another reason for Wellen syndrome, uh, other than um, the things we've talked about, cocaine or methamphetamines are notorious for causing vasospasms of the coronary arteries, and that should be within your differential as well. One more thing I want to mention here, if you're happening to do serial EKGs on this patient, waiting for the patient to go to the cath lab or being admitted, and you see those biphasic T's go away, uh, that's not good. Okay, Bad. that's what's called pseudo normalization. You're like, oh, it's be becoming normal now. No, that normal T wave is on its way to becoming probably a hyper acute, a big, broad, uh, asymmetric T wave relative to the QRS complex. And that's the thing you don't want to see because that means that that pre MI EKG is probably now an MI EKG. He's probably hey, you know, in the process of having his MI right now. You know, what we call that, Mike. What do we call that? Death. That's what we call that. <laughs> well, hopefully not, right? Hopefully, hopefully not. not. 
<laughs> no, well, I'm just being, hey, listen, I'm trying to think of the most serious thing here. I'm trying to, you know, circle back around here. The most serious thing this could be is something that's going to kill this guy, and we've caught it, and that is the goal here. Right. Well, I hope, listeners, you've enjoyed listening to this a little bit different take on our podcast format. You know, usually we do four different segments on different things. We've kind of done it in this, you know, mental framework of seeing a patient and doing the spit, not the spit up, just the spit that Diane, uh, you know, preaches about here. If you liked this way of thinking about patients, if you like thinking about your thinking and you think, you know, I already know all the original emergency medicine boot camp stuff. I know how to work up stuff. Okay, great. That's why you want to come to the advanced boot camp. Don't delay before your schedules get blocked off for September and you're like, ah, well, now I'm stuck. I don't want you to be regretting you not joining us in September. I actually went to the advanced camp first before I went to the original, and I got a lot out of it, even going kind of out of order, if you want to call it that. This thinking about thinking, the metacognition, I just like that word. I just wanted to say it again. Uh, it's such an important part of our clinical careers, day-to-day -day taking care of patients, but also just in our lives, having a successful, long-lasting emergency medicine career, and, and frankly, your life as well as thinking about your thinking. One more thing, Martha and I are going to be on MRAP, okay, Emergency Medicine Reviews and Perspectives. Uh, we're going to be talking about the collegiality in medicine and why it seems to be going away in certain corners of emergency medicine and urgent care. Great response and feedback from you on our discussion with Randy Danielson, uh, the other PA faculty lecturer on the boot camp about the PA title change last episode. If you haven't heard that and you want to know more about it, listen to that. But listen for us on MRAP this month. We're going to talk more about kind of the, the nuances and why I feel like we're all almost kind of talking past each other with certain things like independent practice and supervision. I, I feel like we need, kind of need to come together and really have a shared understanding of, of what that means to physicians, PAs, and nurse practitioners, and more importantly, the patients that we are all working together to take care of. Really great. Very excited that we could bring all this stuff to you today and even more excited that we had Diane here. But before we go, I want us to do our two view trivia answer from last month, Mike. Okay, great. Um, so the question was, name the physician and nurse practitioner duo who came together, found a need in healthcare, created a solution and supported each other by creating the first nurse practitioner program. Who is the duo and what was the specialty that they focused on? So the answer, the first NP was the pediatric program. It was founded in 1965 by Loretta Ford and Henry Silver at the University of Colorado. That was a PNP and an MD together, uh, respectively. And initially, it was established as a certificate program, but it became a master's degree program in the early 1970s. Many of the earliest MP programs were either certificate or postgraduate programs. And the winner this month is Lindsay Harvey, FNP. Congrats to you. But she wanted to give a shout out to, this is so sweet, and Lindsay, God bless you for this. Just give a shout out to Sean Baisley, PA, which was one of her former clinical instructors. Really rad. Okay, well, it's time for our two view trivia question this month. Diane, can I throw it to you? Do you want to ask this question to the listeners? Um, sure. Who is Wellen's syndrome named after? And in what year did he co author the paper that describes what we now know as Wellen's syndrome? Okay. Some good history of cardiology there. All right. Email us your guesses at twoviewcast at gmail.com. That's the number twoviewcast at gmail.com. And also tell us who you want to give a shout out to if you win. I hope we see some of you in Vegas in July. I can't wait. And uh, I'm kind of surprising Martha here. What is our prize if they get this two view trivia question correct? If they get this one correct, they're going to get a brand new recorded copy of the boot camp that we're doing in July. It's really awesome. It's all going to be upgraded, new, fancy, state of the art. They will get a free copy of the entire course. I love that. Okay. Well, go ahead and email us your answers. For more information about us and our faculty, visit our website featuring all our upcoming courses at www.ccme.org. You can also see our new proceduralist website, and that is at www.theproceduralist.org. 
And I just want to say, Diane, thank you for being here. This was awesome. I just love how you make my brain think about thinking. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. I hope this was helpful to people that are listening. You guys are all doing an amazing, amazing job and a specialty that is just remarkable. Keep up the good work. We got a lot of people out there to take care of. And thank you so much for letting me be involved. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, listener, for listening to this episode of The Two View. You can subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Search for Two View Emergency. That's the number Two View Emergency, and it'll come right up. If you like YouTube and want to see the video blog instead where you see that EKG of Wellen syndrome, no apostrophe, sit for Center for Medical Education and you can catch the video version. Don't forget our website where you can go next level any of our topics from any of our episodes, including all the papers and sites we referred to. That's twoview.fireside.fm. Our audio and video engineers are Ricky Bucata and Dave Pett. Show notes are by Meg Dipple. Thank you again for tuning in, friends and EM. Share this podcast with a friend. Share your thoughts via email. And thanks for sharing your time with us on The Two View. Have a good day and a great show.